Yeah, this is our campus, which is totally under fog today, which isn't so great for those of us who want to fly back tomorrow. But so if you can contact the weather gods, try and make it go back to looking like this. Um, I'm going to tell you about... You just have to ask people to just sing along. Um, about a research project that we're working on where we use um, computer simulations in our lab. Um, I'll show you what they're like a bit later to look at the non-monetary features of slot machines. So probably the kind of layman's idea is that this is the whole story of gambling is that you might win a big amount of money. But the current slot machines that we have, they have all these other kinds of events that happen like these near wins. And even that, that's a terrible old fashioned near win um, because the current ones have all of these lines, um, which I'll tell you more about. And they also have these three spins feature, which we may remember from the continuing panel yesterday, and um, things like this double up feature. So we're really trying to get to grips with this complexity and try and figure out what effect all of these parts have. So to start off with, um, we have quite a few studies now looking at near wins. So near wins are losses that are more similar to wins than other losses, losses that resemble wins. So you can see this class, for example, where this looks like it's almost a win, but it's a loss. And in the um, New Zealand legislation, there's this sentence, which I think maybe I need to find someone here to completely explain to me what this exactly means, but it says, you're not allowed to have near wins. So it says the display of the result of the game must not be misleading or deceptive, e.g. it must not properly indicate a near miss. Um, and the literature doesn't know whether it wants to call them near misses or near wins, so, but it's the same thing. It says losses that resemble wins. So this seems like a good idea. So we have um, done some research kind of looking at what these actually do. Um, this is a nice study from the literature that we took as our starting point. What they did was they got 40 problem gam oh, sorry, 28 problem gamblers who played 40 games on each of two machines. And one of the slot machines had near wins and the other one didn't. And then they said, if you, wanna con um, if you were going to continue gambling on one or the other, which one would you choose? And most of them said, the ones that had the one that had the near wins, so that's a really nice start um, that suggests that these are something that is important. That's a good idea to legislate. So what we wanted to do was create a simulation so that we could um, play around a little bit more with when the near wins happened, how they were programmed, which you can't do in in a real poker. So we created this simulation, simulated slot machine in the lab. Um, and on this one, you have the two rows that you can bet on, the one on the top and the one on the bottom. And as you can see on the side, you can choose how much you want to bet, and then you click on um, the click to play button, and then there's an animation, and the outcome is presented from left to right, like on a natural slot machine. And so one of the two of those simulations had near wins. You can see an example on the bottom here, um, they were always this old style sort of classic type where there's four the same and then one different. Um, and then the, uh, in, this, in three of the conditions, the other machine never had any. Um, and so we're always looking to see how people distribute their choices across the two. So, oh, here we go, sorry. I had a nice animation that highlighted what I just said. And so we had these six seven minute conditions. And you can see along here the six pairs of rates of near wins. So those numbers are the percentage of the losses that are near wins. Um, and so we looked to see when people played on these two machines for seven minutes in the lab, which one, how, what proportion of their choices did they make on each one. And these bars are the means. So this. Um, line here, the x-axis is at 0.5. So any bar that is above the mean is telling me that people preferred the slot machine that had the near wins. So you can see that from the means, when there was none on one and some on the other, there's a preference for one that had them. 
And if we look at the individuals, which are these current clients, you can see that for those three conditions, it's quite clear that people allocated more of their responses to the slot machine that had been their line. So most people got to above that line. Um, these ones where they were closer together, it's a little bit messier. So that's a nice first example that you can get some type of sensible data out of these simulations and that people really do prefer the slot machines that have more lines. Um, but our one-line machines don't really look much like what you have if you go to the casino um, tonight. So we're gradually adding complexity to get closer to this. So this is a modern multi a diagram of a modern multi-line machine. Um, in New Zealand, they can have up to 20 lines. And what these lines are telling you is that if you got, perhaps everybody knows this, but um, so if you say went on line nine, it would mean that you had matching symbols along that blue. So it means instead of having to make 20 separate bets one after the other, you can make all of your bets together in one go. So I just want to tell you a little bit about this thing that has been called the Minimax strategy because I think um, our simulations can tell us something interesting about this. So basically, if you go online and you look up a good way to beat the pokies, there's a lot of lies. Where are they? You can't beat them. Um, but what they tell you is what this article says, which is um, a good money management tool is to bet on all the lines, so activate all the lines. That's a lie. You can't do anything to change your favorite rate. So no matter what you do, it's a losing proposition. But there's this idea that what you should do is bet a small amount on all of the lines that you have. And research suggests that that is something that many cheats and slot machine players do. So. If you have a one cent machine, they won't make one 20 cent bet on one of the lines. They'll make 20 one cent bets, cent bets on all of the lines. And so um, in this paper, they had a few reasons about why this might be a common strategy or pattern that people choose to make. So they thought it could be that you increase the probability of winning. It doesn't increase the probability of taking money home at the end but it does increase the probability that one of those lines will win. So you have, so when you're saying it increases the probability of winning, it includes losses disguised as wins. Um, that's the term that um, the Canadian lab that did this research was um, reusing. So this is an example of one that I got at the bar where we play our pub quiz. So sometimes we look at the pokies there. And you can see on this one, I bet 60 cents and I win one thirty cents. So that's the net loss, right? But the machine responds as if this is a win. So that's a loss disguised as a win. The other explanation that that paper had for the Minimax strategy is it reduces what we could call offline wins or a different type of near win. So what these are are wins on a line that you didn't bet on. So the idea is that you want to play all of the lines because you find it frustrating and disappointing to miss out on a win that you would have got. So there's those two sort of possible explanations. There's we're increasing our wins, including losses disguised as wins, and we're reducing our frustratingness of missing out on a win that we would have got. So the key thing is that on a real pokey, if you play the mini-max pattern, you get both of those effects. So we can't tell them apart. So that's why we wanted to use an experimental path to try and separate these apart a bit. So this um, version looks like this. So now we are up to three lines, so we're doing better, we're getting closer. And in this one, you have two machines that you can choose between, but instead of choosing them by choosing the top or bottom line, you can change the other one by clicking that red switch button right there. So you have, again, you say to the student participants, just pick which one you want to play on, um, try to win, play like you're playing for money, and then they can click that switch button to move back and forth between them. So one of the machines has these offline wins like that one that was highlighted there. So you can see from that little arrow, this person has chosen the middle line, so they bet on the middle line, but there's a win that they would have got on the bottom line. So one of the two machines had that possibility. The other machine never has that possibility. 
So the idea here is that if those missing out on a win on another line is frustrating, you should prefer this one because that frustrating thing never happens. Hopefully that makes some partial sense. So what we found is that, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is we decided to try and get to a character. So we gave them two machines that had two different themes. So this one has fruit and this one has bullet trainer. And then after 14 minutes, we told them, now's your chance to bet on two other machines. And they had two different themes. So they were like space and power. And so basically, is every time you change it and you still give them one that has these offline wins and one that doesn't, you get the same pattern of choice, then you become increasingly confident that that's a real effect, um, a real preference that the participants have. So these five are the main preferences in each of those three replications. So in each of these, they're preferring the machine that has those offline wins. So the number, the bars being above that x-axis is means that the mean um, preference or the, the machine that most people put most of their responses on was the one that had the offline ones. Um, these are the individuals, so you can see particularly for the first two that most people put most of their responses on, so most people are above that one. So this is a preference for those offline ones. Um, this third condition, it's interesting that that effect is this clear. I really like to do some more to look and see whether that's an effect of time or something else. So the other thing that we had a look at is, do people think or act as if winning on this line on one thing means that a win is more likely to come on that line on the next one. So that's not true in this simulation. It's not true in a real slot machine where all of the outcomes are independent. But there's some things in the literature that suggest that people might act as if it was true anyway. So we looked at the probability of switching to bet on one of the other lines if it had just had a win that you didn't get, and if it had just had a loss. And for all three, there's a small but consistent tendency for people to treat those wins on the other lines as if they're telling them, this is the hot line that you should bet on next, which wasn't the case. So our overall conclusions about this is uh, that people will prefer those offline wins if they can choose them without affecting their rate of win. They treat them as if they signal upcoming wins even though they didn't. And so this is at least consistent with the idea that the Minimax strategy is not about avoiding those frustrating effects. So I think this is implicating um, those losses disguised as wins as being important. And we have a project that we're going to start this year looking at those. The other thing that we've been looking at are these three swings. And basically, this is an article that an editorial opinion piece in the Sydney Morning Herald. And this, a previous former problem gambler, made this, makes this really strong case that three spins are the whole story of slot machines. What he says is that they are two processes what caffeine is to coffee. If you wanted to make coffee no longer addictive, you'd take the caffeine out. If you wanted to make the slot machines no longer addictive, take the free spins feature out. And so, and there's a nice study where they use a kind of consumer choice method to show that people, in a, with a, in a more systematic way, that people prefer slot machines that have this feature. And we heard about this at the consumer panel, like I said, and they're very heavily advertised on the slot of machines. So my basic thinking was, we'll just get a student to do a fun study to show that obviously people prefer simulations that have these, and then we can go and look at more interesting things about why. So again, we made a simulated machine that had free spins, and you can see here, this is a free spin symbol. And so when they spin around, that symbol is in there, so that's telling you it's possible that you'll get five in a row and win free spins. And we also rigged it a little bit so that they got free spins on one of the early spins just to make sure that they made contact with the fact that this machine had them and that one didn't. 
So again, we're looking to see, do people put more of their sins on this one that has three sins, or do they not care because they're not important? And we controlled the payback percentage, so um, this one, you have a few more of the other types of wins to balance out. So on average, if you put $1,000 into each, you would end up with the same amount left. So uh, again, on this graph, each person has two bars for a, a reason that turns out to be boring. Um, but you can see that preference for the free spin plan is above, is the free spin percent is above the sex axis and the other one is below. And there's just no pattern. If you can find a pattern, then that would be great. So come and tell me. But basically, we didn't get this preference. It seems like it would be so easy and boring, just like this trivial thing to show that even in our simulation, people would like these free spins. But I think that the failure to find an effect of a variable you think you'll find an effect of is actually really interesting. So why didn't we get that effect? One possibility is that when people say they love them, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm not very convinced by <laughs> this idea, but I think we always have to think about the extent to which any of us is good at describing the things in the environment that affect our behavior. Sometimes we're just not aware of how things are affecting us. So maybe people are wrong. I, I think after that panel, I'm increasingly convinced that that's not the answer. The other possibility is that we weren't capturing what's really important about that feature, about the free spin feature. So it's not just that those spins are free, there's something else which in a lot of real slot machines, for example, they increase the amount of the probability of winning being a feature. So for example, they'll even advertise this symbol is wild during the free spin feature, so that means you're gonna get more wins. So this could be something like that, and if we could find that we gradually make it more and more realistic, and then can tip it into an area where people start preferring it, that would be really interesting to find out what it is actually about this feature apart from just the freeness that is the thing that makes people love it so much. The other possibility is that there's something that's different about our participants. So we used university students who were non-gamblers or casual gamblers. So this is just a kind of the idea that most people in New Zealand gamble at some point in their life. So we're just looking at generally the population of people that could walk into a pub or club that has these. But it's possible that they're different. Um, and if you could show that recreational gamblers don't care about the free spin feature, but problem gamblers do, that would be really interesting. And there's this idea that floats around in the literature, um, and we've talked about it a little bit, this idea that slot machines for problem gamblers are more likely to offer this sort of feeling of escape or this being in the zone. And so they might be people who value time on device, what the industry apparently calls time on device. And apparently they call this kind of category um, play to win to play. So there's play to win who, people who want money and there's play to win to play, people who want to be in that zone. And so maybe there's something in that kind of idea that explains why this feature is more valuable to people that gamble a lot and less valuable to our participants. So I think figuring out which of those is the answer would be really interesting. The other thing I wanted to tell you about, because I've been a bit bad and not really talked about anything hugely connected to the theme of the, con of the conference, is some research that we're going to start this year, which is to use online simulation. So it's the same sort of idea of using simulations to isolate individual features of proteins to see how they affect behavior separately. If we put it online, that will really help us to expand the pool of people who can participate and get some more demographic representativeness. It also, after the keynote um, earlier, it's interesting to think about looking at online casual gambling as well. The other thing I just wanted to leave you with is this story that I read that I was very struck by. There's this woman who, on New Year's Day, went to a casino and won $90,000. And then on the 2nd of January, she went back because she hadn't um, received her go, and she won another $90,000. And then in this article, she told the reporter, I am still going to go back and keep gambling more. So I think this is like the flip side of the fact that 
people gamble in spite of the fact that they lose. This question gambling in spite of the fact that she's won. You think if winning was the story, you've won, why are you gambling more? So I think this is telling us that we need to look at some of the features of slot machines apart from the money to figure out what's going on. And um, we've had um, this postdoctoral research thesis supported by Jerome Anderson, which we're really happy and excited about. So thank you to them.